Well, to keep us on schedule, I think we'll we'll go ahead and, and begin. Uh, my name is Bob Nairn. I'm one of the directors of the Water Center, and it is my sincere pleasure to introduce the winner of our 2022 OU International Water Prize, Don Martin Hill. Don is an indigenous Haudenosaunee woman from the Six Nations of the Grand River in Canada. She's a cultural anthropologist and associate professor at McMaster University, and perhaps most importantly, a mother who has raised her girls in a home with no running water. I'm gonna, I wanna give Dawn adequate time to speak, but I, I, I find one of the quotes in her nomination letter to be especially important. Our entire way of life is governed by water. It is spiritual, it is cultural, it is our identity. When you take that away from us, you are literally taking away our culture. Dawn. Thank you, it's an honor to be here and an honor to be the recipient um, of the water prize. Um, it's really humbling and um, important that we uh, have these dialogues around indigenous um, experiences with water. It was a very brief uh, time that I lived without water um, in a home uh, at Six Nations housing, as you may or may not know, is a real problem on reserve. Um, and unless you, you, you're able to build your own, you, you're, you're likely living in the one nobody wants for a little bit. So I think all of us um, somehow experience um, uh, insecurity around water um, sometime in our life if we do live on a reserve or running out of water, which is quite common. So it's, it's something that I lived, but it's not something I really seriously studied until um, the last four years. So part of the work that I do um, is holistic. It's indigenous knowledge and we're interdisciplinary by nature. We're plural um, by nature. Um, we have many uh, different ways of understanding the world and bringing that to McMaster sciences, biology, um, uh, health, as well as uh, engineers has been an interesting <laughs> and, and somewhat fun um, experience. Um, so this project's a little bit different because it is um, it is led by the community and it's an iterative process that's adapting to findings um, as we go along the journey. So I'll start with this Prezi that Colin Gibson, our project manager, helped put together. He's masterful. Hopefully it works and keeps me on track. Mainly it keeps me on track. So, um, let's see what's uh, happening here. I'm not running the, the, the uh, video. So at the bottom, you can see there's the two row wampum. We talked about how that's one of the first treaties ever made in the Americas with the Dutch. And uh, the community partners for this research project are everyone from public works to health services, the birthing center, um, STEAM Academy, the uh, Guy Winio High School, we have multiple partners. Um, where we are located uh, as a reserve in, in Canada, um, in relation to you all here at the University of Oklahoma, is actually quite a distance um, to get out here, but part of what we like to do is really position people and help them see where we're from. And as you can see, we're surrounded by the Great Lakes. Um, we're, we're literally called Six Nations of the Grand River, and the river that uh, follows the Haldeman Tract or the Haldeman Agreement that we made with uh, the British um, after the wars, um, uh, was one of the last wars, um, we were able to secure our water base and our source water. <clears throat> we tried to use our treaties, um, which were made with wampum, which come from the water. So everything is interrelated, including the agreements we made. And the top one with the two rows of purple is about traveling down the river of life together uh, in coexisting and not trying to steer the other person's boat or ship. It's quite a beautiful uh, document that was first made with the Dutch and later the British and then later uh, Americans, Canadians. <clears throat> so our strength is in our Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's five tribes originally. And my daughter is holding the Hiawatha, one of the most well-known belts. 
which is our flag. It's our national symbol. Um, our team has to embrace interdisciplinarity and it's very complex. It requires a bit more energy than you know, uh, some of us are used to. And, and as you can see here, we have a mixture of elders, engineers, uh, UN, university, um, biologists, and it's amazing what we can do when we put our minds together, which is literally a teaching in the great law, um, which we try to practice. So we have a number of grants under the Global Water Futures. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but the primary ones are the co-creation of indigenous water quality tools, and then the, the indigenous ecological knowledge training, mixed method tools. So one is uh, organized in such a way that um, I know it, it looks a little complicated, but you can see the deliverables and the different teams that we have and the different team leads. Um, so whether it's training, uh, mental wellness, health, uh, sub teams or water governance, they're associated with certain deliverables and then they're associated with the committees you see. And these are all different people. They're not all the same people from the community. So it requires quite a bit of coordination. On the other grant, we have um, made a commitment to make all our tools bilingual because our, our, our languages are disappearing as you no residential schools outlawed the speaking of our language and we're really trying hard to save that because that's where the ecological knowledge is it's in the language you can't have traditional ecological knowledge without the language um, so we're trying to save that and that's one thing that's thematic across the board how we organize this is simply having a number of teams and, and they, they feed each other. So they're not isolated silos. We do meet as larger groups because the sensor team needs to know what the biologists found in their water testing in order to develop their sensors. And then they talk to elders who kind of directed them to look at things like mercury, things that the scientists weren't looking at. And lo and behold, they found quite a bit of the uh, heavy metals. So now the sensors are gonna be redesigned to look for those heavy metals because that's what the elders want. So it's very much a dialogue between all these different teams, our findings, and then looking at the health implications, developing the questionnaires, the surveys with the local uh, experts in the community, as well as with elders. So it, it goes through a number of vetting processes before we actually start collecting water or doing any of these activities. So there's a lot of upfront uh, negotiations and discussions. We also work with local um, groups. So we don't try to impose our will, but um, on the right hand side, you can see that's the two row wampum uh, paddle. So our scientists and our youth went out on collecting water, teaching others. We also went out on the, and looked at decommissioning dams, which ones would we start? We also have the kids out there collecting um, baseline uh, eco um, assessments so that we can begin training them and developing capacity in the community, as well as having uh, events that they can attend and learn about the project and sign up to work with us so that we are engaging the community on every level in the schools, the leadership, the elders, especially the women. Um, and then here's our elected chief on the, on the side there. He's just really young. I think he's the youngest chief in Canada. So we have um, a, a great group of people that have to work together um, and engage to design the project and to be adapting as the findings are released to the other teams and it's 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 complicated but what we found is it's holistic it brings together a sense that uh, these things are interrelated it allows us to trace what needs to be done and where do we put our energies to mitigate some of the impacts that we're seeing from industrial waste so indigenous ways of knowing brings in a different way, a different methodology, if you will, a different framework and epistemology. And, and in the end, scientists do enjoy listening to elders. Um, I think they recognize there's some logic and, and scientific validity to what they're talking about, even though they may express it differently than uh, the, the English language would. 
the scientists have always agreed with their their fundamental um, premises. So there's never been any tensions about those things. It's just how we express it. It may be song, dance, it may be in our art, maybe in our storytelling, but that's where we understand our knowledge exists and lives. And it's people like myself that try to glean and translate some of that knowledge into scientific applications and methodologies so that we can begin to apply indigenous ways of knowing. One of the indigenous ways of knowing is digital stories. And here's one that a student of mine made. She's brilliant. Um, she's now doing public health masters and she's also uh, involved in the language. Kata <laughs> So that's where the Oneganos name comes from, listening to elders about the first words ever spoken in our creation story were the words Oneganos, and also the many words for water, which we really are really beautiful. They're, <laughs> we don't have time to go over them all. So we developed a, a framework um, based on our traditional teachings and pictograph format um, that our people often use to convey information. And so we involve art to express this to the community, but also to other researchers. So as you can see, um, the turtle's back is, is we are a matriarchal lunar calendar people and we move in cycles and there's 13 cycles on a turtle's back. So part of our research involves turtle tracking because the elder said whatever's going on with the turtle is gonna be an indicator of what's happening to the water and to humans and the biologists agreed. So we're just getting that data in now. Um, but we also have different ways of communicating our results as well as identifying the methods by collecting the data. Part of that is being able to translate the complicated graph you saw earlier. This is exactly the same thing. It's just done in a Haudenosaunee um, way. So training and collaboration was what the first things the elders identified, the chiefs, the leaders um, that we work with, that we needed the, the the youth to uh, have the skills, not the scientists to come in and do everything and just have them as helpers, but they wanted them trained. They wanted them fully engaged. They wanted language applied. So they gave us a really high bar of what we needed to do. This is a trip to the Smithsonian that we went with the high school in language immersion because we were pulling really old maps and documents about the Great Lakes. We've also sent a number of young people to the United Nations to present their digital stories on water, to advocate for water protection, um, to look at legal avenues on ways that our community can begin uh, protecting our source water. So building allies and networks have really been beneficial. All of the young people we've sent to the UN have continued to, to move in, in those circles and be invited and uh, voices were elevated. So it's very important to engage young people. The way that we mobilize the information was through a podcast and um, partly due to COVID, but partly due to young people who had uh, what we call social influencing, uh, large social media accounts, um, well-known influencers in the water protecting world, if you will, um, come in. And, and in that space, we would also address science. Um, it, it was a way to get our people involved without hitting them over the head with too much information regarding our data collection or if they wanted to sign up for water testing. So sharing the information, we did art 
uh, through the schools. We delivered supplies. It went really well. They did stories about water. We also went to the schools and we asked the kids to help us draw maps and identify places that were meaningful, how they, uh, what their relationship was to the water, whether they were fishing, harvesting medicine or looking for turtles. Um, so all of the, that information allows the community to begin having ownership over this data. And that was all in preparation to start our indigenous mapping, which is a Terra story program that was developed by Rudo Kemper from Digital Democracies, who's still working with us. And what we did is we had the kids do some work and develop digital stories, develop GIS data, um, do water testing. And through that, McMaster gave them certificates of completion. Youth accreditation was very important to our elders and youth. So we went and worked with the teachers. Academy, our environmental science class conducted an environmental assessment at Mohawk Park in collaboration with the Enablers Project. For the environmental assessment, our class utilized ArcGIS in a multitude of ways for data collection of the land and water within the Holloman Track. The collaborations and data collected were then able to be displayed through the mapping feature in ArcGIS. With Omega Moses' help, our class was able to label our maps with the Haudenosaunee languages, pictures, and data. We then took all our information and created story maps to present our project findings. So the youth um, are creating baseline data and the goal is that they continue to upload this information year after year and we have our own uh, what we call data sovereignty um, because there was no sensors put along the reserve um, there's no data around six nations so now we're collecting that and creating this platform part of that platform also looks at archaeological sites our history, our stories about the Great Lakes, how to manage stewardship, our laws, treaties. So it really is all encompassing. And there's other information we'd like to upload, but the program we're needing to look at real time data. That's what the mothers want is, is real time data uh, capabilities that we don't quite have yet, but we're working on it. We also have elders such as Jock uh, Hill, who's been with us since the beginning, identifying ways to do this research. I think it's so yeah. In our teachings, we have many, this is only one, one, uh, one or two items here to, to, uh, that connects us to who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to be and, and to remind ourselves when we see these things, it's a reminder that you take a pause and you remind that we have a purpose and a duty and a responsibility here on this earth for that short time we're here. So we have many things, and that's one of the things the ceremonies do, is they keep reminding us of our place in this world. Uh, we're reliant on all living things and all of the workers about the earth. So that's how we begin our, our uh, ceremony, is setting the, the minds on our place in this world. Sorry about that. I don't know what it was. It's not on the original mapping, maybe when he recorded it. But Jock has a lot of teachings about turtles and about our roles and responsibilities. And so we're really gearing this towards secondary school universities to give youth encouragement to think about their environment and how they are supposed to steward it and give them the tools to do so. So monitoring our environment was a big uh, priority for a lot of the um, local uh, experts, what I call people been working in public works for 30 years. Um, every day, this is what they do. So I went to them first and they helped identify what needed to be done, what kind of monitoring would be useful, and then the training um, and the tools, the sensors that the engineers are developing was co-designed by a number of stakeholders um, in, in order for it to be useful, but also low cost. Charles is our, our, our um, chemical engineer, and he's been identifying and, where the source uh, of contamination is coming Lowe's from. Past a bunch of large cities. Lowe's near to Guelph. Guelph has an estuary that combines with the Grand River. Flows by Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, Brantford. And eventually, in the next click, flows past Six Nations of the Grand River. So really Six Nations is at the tail end, at the bottom of a lot of industrialized cities. 
and all of these cities are dumping wastewater into the Grand River. All those green dots on that map represent wastewater treatment plants that spill their water into the Grand River. Now, that wastewater is treated for the most part, treated up to a level that we've deemed as a Western society to be acceptable for releasing into an environment. But what they don't tell you um, very often is that under rainstorms, under large water events, like a heavy rainstorm or a storm, uh, a lot of raw untreated sewage will be dumped into the river because they overflow the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant. And so for the past, you know, this is a very, what you can see is this is a very industrialized river. It's been treated uh, basically like a garbage dump for a hundred years. Only in the 70s and 80s have we started to treat uh, water that's flowing into the, into the Grand River. And yet our current technologies don't treat all the wastewaters that are flowing into the Grand River. We still have these overflow uh, contamination events. So I think the uh, community really wanted to get a handle on how to address this issue. They're, they're aware of it, but they needed to see what to do about it. And that's where Ravi uh, comes in with building the sensors so that we can begin where better we monitoring. Have, we have some of the sensors that, are, that have already been field deployed. So what you see in the top uh, left corner is uh, it's an oxygen sensor. Uh, that has been deployed for about uh, two years now uh, in terms of monitoring oxygen in soil. Um, we also have a, a smart node, a wireless transmission system that has been loaded up. Uh, and we did some preliminary testing in um, in Six Nations uh, before uh, the shutdown happened. Um, and, and what you see in the bottom is something that we are developing. So this is this is an example of a, of a pill type sensor. It comes in, in sort of um, round beads. It's similar uh, to the beads that go into baby diapers, right? And the nice thing with these baby diapers is they absorb a lot of water, but along with water, they also absorb contaminants, uh, heavy metals, for instance. And so what you see is one of those beads that have been um, uh, added to with, uh, with a dye that is sensitive in this case to copper. And what it shows is the different levels of copper that is present in the water that is uh, that is seen. And so what you see is a very visual demonstration. And then with a cell phone, you can take an image of some one of these beads, compare it with um, other beads of similar color, and then identify what is the uh, concentration of copper. What we want to do uh, is to extend this to um, harmful uh, elements like uh, lead and, and arsenic and, and mercury. And with that, what you can do is you can take sample of water anywhere that you are interested in, put a drop of bead into that, and that will then change color. And then by taking a picture of that bead, you should be able to tell the concentration of that particular contaminant that is present in the water. Oh. And then it is up to the community then to identify where they want to go and measure. And our hope is that the community will then go on to measure over a wide area and accumulate this information onto the website so that we now have a geographical information over seasons and over time on how these contamination levels are changing. And this could be a community driven science uh, yeah. in terms of accumulating information that is important for the community. And, uh, and, and through that, we know certain facts that may not necessarily be evident before. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of the, the, the entire uh, purpose of this uh, low cost method of, of sensing is to empower the community in order to uh, make that information available without necessarily somebody outside from the community actually coming and telling what it is. Right? So that's uh, at the top there, you can see Mankasha and Dexter and they were the podcast hosts that would navigate these um, various engages for the community, but the sensors um, we want uploaded into the mapping um, platform so that you can see over time, where is it safe to fish because our people are still fishing out of the Grand River and where is it safe to essentially bathe. Um, we saw people swimming when it was really hot. So we're trying to give them information. As well, the elders identified climate change as a priority, along with the elected council who wanted to look at what they need to prepare for, because most First Nations in Canada do not have access to 
uh, preparation fundings or mitigation fundings for climate change and how will that impact water. So Tariq Dean and Atliff were um, looking at overall baseline data and information on the temperature changes at Six Nations and, and being able to see what kind of impacts that might have on our water systems as well as our ability um, to, to grow because we are an agricultural society. Um, we've always have been and and uh, it, it will impact when we plant, how we plant, um, and it's already impacting those things. So food security then becomes tied to water uh, security. And our goals as a community um, for the Six Nations Community Plan, you can see how um, it started to incorporate some of the thinking um, that our findings were. So our goal is just to hand the community, all the different stakeholders, the information and their, their experts to do what they do with it. We also do our publications as you need to in order to get grants. Um, so all of those publications are in different journals, uh, peer reviewed for our data and our findings, um, which is important. And I think even the community wants to know that there's a quality control, if you will, over the kind of science we're doing. The UN University and University of Windsor Indigenous Law has been looking at ways because uh, governance ultimately is at the heart of all of this. So if you look at the Great Lakes, which is very central to Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, um, what we find is that, you know, our history is tied directly to there. All of those dots are, are communities, reserves. Uh, uh, there's a, over 148 that rely heavily on the water from the Great Lakes and the watersheds, which have been really neglected, in my view, over time. And while there's been great attention paid to cleaning up the Great Lakes, from both the US and Canada, and it's somewhat successful. It's a great investment if you do a cost analysis um, as has been done, um, but we have a lot more to do in, in Canada overall. So Global Water Futures put together this interactive map that we're incorporating into our map to kind of give a glimpse of what's happening across Canada and where do we fit in as Six Nations um, to this overall emerging water crisis. Um, so getting a, a broader view is really important for community as well as to fit into this larger narrative that we need to do better, we need to do more as, as uh, policymakers, as, as law, um, uh, and making our treaties uh, more useful in water protection. So while we're still you know, dealing with criminalizing people who are simply trying to protect what little resources they have left, it's still happening at high rates. Grassy Narrows is uh, one of our, our collaborators. We, we want to work with them uh, when our sensors are finished. I mean, the contamination has, has destroyed many, many lives um, with neurological damage across generations. Um, and, and their area looks pristine. So most people are surprised. Other people are surprised to find out how many water advisories exist in Canada. It says 84, but Six Nations is not on that water advisory, even though we don't have access to clean water because the water treatment plant isn't piped into our homes. So we have a water treatment plant, but we don't have the funding to put it into homes and we don't importantly have money for waste treatment. So we don't merit um, any of this uh, funding that the government released because we don't fit their idea of a, a water uh, crisis community um, or what they call boiled water advisories. Um, but doing and understanding equity and injustice is a big part of the governance and ways that that why is it that my community is centrally located around Hamilton, Brantford, Hagersville, Caledonia, not far from Niagara Falls and Toronto, um, we don't have uh, clean uh, water access. Um, and there's no other way to put that, it's because we're indigenous. On top of that, we have multinational companies like Nestle, um, that was taking 3.6 million liters a day from our aquifer, which is quite deep. Um, I'm trying desperately to get a study on groundwater, put a grant in with um, kind of a rock star. So I'm hoping we'll actually get the, the groundwater study done. 
we need to know how much water do we have left? How do we access that water? And our youth lead, along with some clan mothers and faith keepers, our grandmother's council have taken on Nestle and were very effective. They went to the Confederacy Council. They got a cease and desist order. Um, she went to the United Nations complaining about Nestle taking the water without consent um, to a water insecure community which is adding insult to injury that they're selling it back to us um, because we have to purchase bottled water. So, so being able to educate and, and, and do actions is very important to an indigenous community-led research uh, project. And, and it's been effective. Now, yes, we did have Nestle pack up and leave. Um, but then Blue Triton came in, which is even scarier because they're not actually a bottling company. It's more like water's going on the free market, which has been um, the United Nations, multiple agencies' worst nightmare is seeing water traded like oil. And this is one of the ground zero places it's starting to happen is that Six Nations in our treaty territory. So having our young people uh, versed, uh, meeting with lawyers, working with community, mobilizing community, um, getting to all the different bodies that are important outside of Canada at the United Nations has been critical to being able to be effective in, in, in saving our water. Uh, the, the, the new Blue Triton is actually taking more than 3.6 million liters a day. The Doug Ford government gave them, I believe, 5 million liters a day, and they operate every single day round the clock. Um, so we don't know how much water is left. And that's why getting a groundwater study is essential. A hyd hydrogeologist um, I'm working, reached out to, they've been really, really great, but we haven't been able to get the funding for some time. So this is our third attempt at getting an assessment of our groundwater. So being able to give the community all of the tools they need, not only to educate them, but to be active, to empower them, um, it is moving into what we call warrior science. And it's taking actions that are peaceful. They align with our great law of peace. They align with our treaties. Um, they align with our philosophy as indigenous people, but they're also uh, weaponizing this information so that they can fight and stop resource extraction um, uh, and trading of, of our resource and getting absolutely no say in any of that. So if you look at the Great Lakes overall, this is just another example of, of the kind of economic um, impact that that water has outside of Nestle making trillions of dollars and we have calculated it is over a trillion dollars they made off of our, our water. Um, the Great Lakes, while they've invested in the last 50 years as a transboundary agreement between the US and Canada, um, they're also, you know, looking at, well, how much money does the Great Lakes generate? So some studies have come out, and this is Chris Brackley, who's built wonderful uh, cartography mapping, um, doing all kinds of studies around the Great Lakes for many, many years, following the story. Um, and looking at the fact that the Great Lakes investing $34 billion over 50 years, um, the return has been threefold. And if the Great Lakes region were a country unto itself, it would have the third largest G GDP um, besides China and the United States. So water is important to the economics of our country, but it doesn't mean that if you're if you're investing in cleaning up water that you're hurting the economy. In fact, this proves the opposite. If you're investing in water and clean up, the economy started to thrive. Areas became um, thriving harbor fronts such as Hamilton and Toronto, as well as on the United States. So we're trying to make that cost analysis an appeal to people who may not care about environment and, and feel that it's stopping them from you know, having an economic um, uh, presence, we're trying to appeal to that population as well. So in here where you see 30, 34 and so on, that's where we are. What they've done with this investment is they didn't invest in the watersheds. Like all of 
these lakes are interconnected. So what's happening in a watershed is still going to impact Lake Ontario. What's happening in our area is going to affect Lake Erie. It's all interconnected. These are all veins, and that's the way the elders understand them. So you need to take care of the watersheds, and that's been our, our big push to the people who are investing and in, in cleaning up the Great Lakes is don't you know, to invest in watersheds and protections there. So I think, you know, part of our mapping project is to give people a visual of the data that we're collecting to be able to upload, for example, algae blooms in real time. Um, several times now, there's been severe algae blooms in our area. So the um, climate change uh, researchers at the two directions. So oh, this is, this is Jack and Elder. the sunrise, you would just go on the north side of the river and that current took you that way and you travel in a canoe with ease. And when you want to come back west and you just cross the lake, cross the river and go back. So his evil brother saw that and he went and stuck his hand in the water and he stirred it all up and he pushed stones, threw stones in there and he dug out so that there's dangers now in the water. But they also would look, some areas he made look nice, but they were actually dangerous. So like the waterfalls and that, things like that, the rapids, they look beautiful, but they also can take a human life if you're not careful. So I just kind of yep. an overview so far as that went. And uh, it come down to that uh, they got a, they were in contention of who would control. So they played lacrosse and they played lacrosse for many days and it didn't settle. So then they played the dish game. Uh, the dish game is air into humans. So that's what they say was her body and her head become the uh, nighttime sky, the moon and the star beings. Sorry, I didn't set that up very well. <laughs> I forgot it was in here. So that's Jock, and he's giving us the creation story of the two brothers. There's a good brother and a bad brother. Um, and, and how important that water was made specifically for us. But there's always the negative that causes trouble, essentially. And that is, exists in us forever in all time. Um, the other part was the women were really concerned about the health and wellness of, of water insecurity or water contamination. So we worked really hard um, through our PhD student, Sarah Dugnan and Afroza, to develop surveys um, and work with the midwives, work closely with the birthing center and, and look at how many people were being born into homes in water insecure homes. And it was quite a few. Well, what are the impacts of those? And we were surprised um, to find out that it was actually a, a lot of mental health implications for water insecurity. Um, beyond having physical health uh, conditions such as, you know, um, uh, wound care after birth um, was problematic and uh, babies having skin rashes and so on. So there's a lot that then becomes problematic for mom trying to take care of baby when she herself may um, not be able to have access to the amount of waters that she needs to get through the day. So we found that to be quite interesting and as well, we did a community survey, um, we did focus groups, we, we've also done youth, um, and, and what we found were some of the things associated with um, uh, water insecurity was um, anxiety and depression, but also, you know, in it, it does impact things like um, skin rashes, people not wanting to, um, um, anemia, you're not, drinking water so maybe you're giving your children juices and other things so there's so much there in terms of having lack of access to clean water that we just didn't even we didn't even imagine when we walked into this um so it became apparent it was just literally all in all encompassing um so when you look at nestle or these other companies taking water while well, we've got young moms in our community um, without access to running water or clean water, treated water, if you will, um, uh, using maybe rain water that was then causing problems with their children, you know, it becomes a little infuriating um, that, that our, our 
people have to live in that environment in a very water rich region in, in a very wealthy country. Um, so part of this we realized had a lot of impact on the mental health, even as we're delivering our findings about how much contamination is in the water, especially since we wanted to make it accessible that you could download it on your app. Um, you would be able to to be able to monitor water. We realized we needed to really think about empowering actions. So we did a number of workshops and came up with, you know, river remediation knowledge exchanges, you know, decommissioning dams, developing a, an app for mental um, wellness. I think she presented this morning um, for McMaster. Um, taking youth to the UN to meet other youth from around the world, engaging in community things like the True Roll Paddle, um, storytelling such as creating digital stories, working on our virtual reality language um, and, and culture, as well as just sharing through Let's Talk Water um, with community. We had over 30 episodes and it was became really important to have this dialogue with community because it is an iterative and we were listening to their feedback and to their concerns. And, and, and that's part of what makes a community-led project a little bit different from this set siloed approach where I'm gonna look at this one thing and then when I find it, you know, maybe try to mitigate, but it's not looking at the whole. And so Indigenous knowledge tries to work with knowledge guardians so that we can um, not only work with the whole, but do things they care deeply about, like all of our tools being bilingual so that they can be used in, in our immersion schools so that their continuation of our knowledge and our language um, became important. So even in the virtual reality, you can log on in Mohawk um, in English, and then we'll be adding hopefully Cayuga and some of the other languages. So it's it's a bit tough, but it's also beautiful and and empowering and uplifting. Um, so part of this is is a story we put together for youth time ago, to learn about water. It's a, it's a VR. You need headsets. Sky people and Sky World was a place of everlasting life. In Skyworld stood a shining celestial tree that resembled a wild cherry. This is the tree of life. Skywoman stu Lipman, students made this. Her name was Ojitzizo, which means mature flower. Her uncle was Rade Zerunjas, sky chief. He is the overseer of the heavens. One day he asked Sky Woman to go get water. He asked her to make three trips. He told her not to stop and not to speak to anyone. On her third trip, she met a lacrosse player and he asked her if she would give him a drink. The Sky Chief learned that she disobeyed him. He was upset with a lacrosse player and banished him from Sky World. But he forgave Sky Woman. Sky Woman had a craving for a root, and she asked Sky Chief to dig some of the roots up for her. He dug a hole at the base of the Tree of Life, which caused it to be uprooted. Sky Woman was curious and looked into the hole. And when she did, she fell into the hole. As she fell, she grabbed strawberries. As she was falling, the lacrosse player came to break her fall. After leaving Sky World, he transformed into a meteor. He picked her up and carried her down to the Earth's upper atmosphere. All water, the original life form. Then the geese saw her as she was falling, and they carried her on their wings. 
It was the great turtle that came to the surface and said to the geese, On my shell you will place her. All of the water animals came to greet her. She said to the animals, It is earth that I need to be able to live. The beaver volunteered to dive and bring up some earth, and he failed. Then the otter volunteered to dive and bring up some earth, and he also failed. It was the muskrat that succeeded in bringing up the earth in his paw for her. As she shuffles on the back of the great turtle, the earth expands rapidly. Sowing the seeds of survival, <coughs> cultivating the seeds of consciousness, mm. and harvesting the hope for humanity. <laughs> the muskrat gets me every time. So um, the teachings um, about water, we go through time, past, present, future, and, and that's how we want our young people to be able to understand both the Western and, and, and um, Indigenous knowledge and create essentially a very active, mobilized warrior science, um, warrior in our culture. The words actually translate to, to a good path of up, uplifting, upholding the people. It's, it's not what the West has made a warrior out to be, which is very, very different um, from the original concept. Um, so, you know, looking at warrior science camps and being able to keep this moving by embedding it in schools is the only way I can see it being sustainable. And hopefully that's what we're, we're aiming for is, you know, having a platform that will be sustained by the uh, schools, the sensors that will be able to send out so families um, are it's low cost, they'll be able to download it to an app. Um, these things will be made by the kids in the school, uh, maintained by the kids in the school, as well as the mapping, along hopefully with researchers and other First Nations, um, because this project isn't going to go forever. Um, it's been hard. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the next chapter, and I really appreciate your time and patience um, listening and happy to have been here and be, be able to present the work that our people are doing. You can go to our website. These are the digital stories, our immersion kids made, our student, everybody um, has contributed from the community and they're beautiful. And they're also, um, you know, in a language. And, and, and that's again, another legacy that we hope to have left besides the, the other things that we're doing with the um, films and, and VR, which we hope to have available within the next six months. So we're publishing um, quite a bit and you can find all of those chapters and books as well as um, journals. We have booklets that we give out to community um, that are much easier to read. So, <laughs> um, so yes, please do stop me and I'll, I'll end there. Thank you, Nawi Dani too. Thank you so much, Dawn. Uh, I think we're, we're butting up against our, our, our next concurrent sessions. Uh, Dawn will be uh, around if you have questions. I, I think you may be able to catch her in one of the concurrent sessions, but I'm gonna ask that we, that we go ahead and, and move on to our, our, next, uh, our, our next set of talks. Thank you so much, Dawn. It was very inspiring and uh, just a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.